for talking about We are live now. Okay. <laughs> so hello and welcome back to another installment of our live video series, Conversations That Matter. Uh, we are Mark and Heidi. Heidi, and we dive into topics that we think our audience we're often familiar with integral and or spiral dynamics theory. We'll take some interest in it. Uh, this series is bought, brought to you through our website, thewisdomfactory.net, which is dedicated to spreading out into the world by live conversation with very special people who have experience, knowledge, and wisdom to share with all of us. And Heidi, you want to talk about the timestamps, yeah. how people can comment. Uh, I hope you are watching from the wisdomfactory.net. If not, in YouTube, we won't, uh, um, how do you say, monitor the comments. Please mm -hmm. go to wisdomfactory.net and click on live streaming, and then you will be led to the website mm -hmm. page where you can view and write your comments, and we will monitor the comments there. Mm -hmm. And tomorrow or let's say Sunday, you will also find the, the replay with the timestamps. We yeah. will figure out what the people said and what place. So you can review it and maybe understand it better because I think today there will be some technical terms yeah. Yeah. which we ask our guests to explain a little bit, but you might want to see it again. And speaking of those two guests, we have two guests today, and they can greatly contribute to our long-term help and happiness. Yes, that's a big deal. <laughs> By helping us choose the right intimate partners for us and to help us improve our lives with them as we bounce along through life. Mm -hmm. And please remember that the older we get, the more highly we rate the quality of our relationships as the greatest single factor toward our satisfaction with life. This is a big deal, people, okay. So this conversation is between Tom Habib, a psychotherapist with long experience in what works and what doesn't work in close relationships. So would you say hello, Tom? Just hi. Good morning, Heidi and Mark. Okay. Good morning. Great. Yeah, you morning. are in sunny California. Yep. And we had a talk with you already mm -hmm. in, I think it was in September. And people who are interested in it, I have it linked on the page, mm -hmm. thewisdomfactory.net, and their personal page where you can view now mm -hmm. the conversation. Yep. And you will find it there. The same is with our other guest. The other guest. Oh, you mean Martin Lucek. Mm -hmm. okay. He has been several times already yeah, with yeah. us. And you will find <laughs> the conversations, the previous conversations also linked uh -huh. in that web page. Yeah. And I, I guess we could say that Martin is probably best known for his manual for men. Uh, integral, integral relationships, relationships. <laughs> which women can read too, by the way. So say hello, Martin. Uh, hello, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> he took it literally. Yeah. <laughs> I put the quotation marks in around the wrong words. Uh, 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 okay, so we have hosted both of these guests before, and that's why we're having them. I know, and that's why we're having them back okay, because we good. like what they said. Mm -hmm. uh, so now I think we should go to them and give them each a chance to correct any mistakes we any lies we told about them or yeah what? I should still say both are very grounded in integral perspective oh, yeah. on life mm -hmm. and so we will hear a little bit about the application of integral theory let's say to our personal life yeah. and we will ask them when they use the technical terms to explain it or let's say so if you are not so sure please ask us yeah in the comment stream ask what they mean <laughs> what are you guys talking about yes <laughs> okay. all right so okay so, so go over to yeah. both of you well who should we go to ask first or let, let's see who starts talking, okay? I'd be willing to start. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. So when you talk about the intimate relationship, whatever developmental progress you think you've made individually, 
is going to be tested when you enter intimacy. And those of our listeners that are familiar with the quadrants, we understand that what emerges when we're in the intimate relationship is all four quadrants at once. For example, the, the upper right, the physiological emergence when you're in um, the intimate relationship, especially if you're fighting. Uh, Gottman had shown that the couple's body looks like it's preparing for war. And even when it's a more pleasant form of intimacy, last night I was working with a couple and I asked them to look at each other. They couldn't smile. They just had to soften their eyes and look at each other for 30 seconds. You would think I was asking them to walk over a bed of coals <laughs> to see how uncomfortable they became. And we're only talking about the upper right quadrant. As Martin knows, it, it all comes up at once. And it will test our ability to show up and stay present. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So do you do you want to go into the other quadrants now? Yeah. Or was it a question from Mark Martin? Mm -hmm. Were you asking something of of Martin, Tom? Um, uh, sure. I was wondering if Martin has seen that also, that how the quadrants show up um, in intimate relationships. Hmm. Well, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm not a therapist. and I don't <laughs> usually work with people. And uh, But what I find interesting in, in regards to, you know, relationship is, it's like this aligning our values with our actions. Mm -hmm. and, and as you, uh, I think you mentioned that, that it, it comes up, you know, this only really comes up when you're relating with other people. And so, you know, I often or sometimes find so like these, you know, I'm, I'm an advocate for being in relationship, obviously, versus being single or, or serial monogamy and things like that. And, and I think, for me, the important point there is is that that when you have friendships or or other non intimate uh, uh, relationships or uh, romantic relationships where you observe in a way twenty four seven at a level of all the seven chakras, right? You can say a lot of things and or pretend a lot of things like I'm a very kind, loving, orderly caring compassionate whatever right you can you can maintain anything and you can you can keep up that appearance in your circle of friends or at your workplace or wherever you interact with people uh, but it's often very hard for them or impossible for them to verify if this is really true and and only if you're so like observed you know over longer periods of time you know, when you take off your clothes and when you cook or when you interact with your family and friends, so that, you know, in a way where, where, where your self-image in the upper left, right, or what, who you think you are and how you actually behave, you know, there is a, a dissonance between the two. And, and in a way, only an a intimate partner uh, you know, if you have a healthy relationship, can call you on these things. Mm -hmm. And when your normal friends or, or community or whatever calls you on these things, you can either like say, well, that's fake news. That's just not true. <laughs> or you can relatively easily then change your friends and say, well, you're no longer, I no longer like you and I fire you. <laughs> you know, I'm playing a little bit on recent politics, I know, right? Yeah. You're no longer loyal to me. I no longer like how you, you know, you're no longer my friend. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a committed, intimate relationship, you know, you can either then, you know, the, the relationship will suffer or, you know, what, what I'm sure you, Tom, and, and relationship experts uh, mm -hmm. uh, suggest is that now the work begins to, to deepen you know, to take a deeper look at yourself and to al align your values with your actions. Yes. That's, that's why I find the quadrant so interesting because, uh, you know, that applies, of course, to, uh, you know, your interior values and, 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 and your behavior, your physical behavior, and also how you interact with other people 
and and your social environment, right? And these are obviously the four dimensions that we're that we're interacting with this with with our interior self and with our physical body and with our relationships with others and with our social environment. Yes. Before, uh, before you got on, Martin, Heidi and Mark and I were talking about how much more difficult it is for a person to enter a second tier space. And I love what you said that because more of us show up in the form of shadows and unintegrated other aspects of ourselves, that the risk we have with our intimate partner and the amount of accountability seems to be inhibitory in terms of moving into that space. So I was telling Mark that at San Diego Integral, we're experimenting with focus integral group discussions where we show up in a we space. And it's actually easier to do it there than it is to do it with a, another intimate person. Mm -hmm. um, for the reasons you said, all those aspects of our self um, need to be accounted, that the values show up and they need to be accounted for. Now we know on the other hand, it shows the potential when the trust flows of what the intimate couple could do. But it is riskier, for the reasons you said. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely because you wouldn't just go away like you can do it with a friend. No, it, <laughs> you have a sort of a commitment with the partner. So um, it's, it's not so easy. And so it's, it's harder to keep up the fake news, you know, with an intimate But, but this partner. is the big challenge yes, and the big is. chance Huge. to really mm. get yourself straight together with your partner. Mm -hmm. No. And I, I would like you to talk a little bit about this possibility, what the partner can can be for your own growth. You, you said. To whom we speak. Oh, both. <laughs> you plural. Well, you always go first, Tom. <laughs> if, if I can back up a little bit, Heidi, and frame this in preparation for this talk with Martin, um, I was thinking that where we get the discrepancy of people at first tier and second tier among partners, I imagine there's a lot of people that attend these integral conferences who might be in a relationship with significant stage development discrepancy. And, you know, there aren't a lot of people, as we know, capable of holding this space. Um, and so they may indeed, people that are involved in the integral uh, conferences and learning about it, maybe with a partner that, that are not there. So I thought it would be interesting for Martin and I to talk a little bit about what does it take in order to uh, promote that development and try to get more symmetry uh, between the partners? Who are at different levels of consciousness, you mean? Yes. What's your experience around that? Well, I, you know, I, I don't see a lot of people at second tier. I mean, somebody that's single, trying to find someone that can really hold second tier space for any length of time. There's just not a lot of people. Well, the reality is the, the evolutionary emergence at this point it's trying to get people that are at healthy green space, use spiral, and try to promote moments where they can float up and handle a little bit more unitive space. And it's easy, like some of the uh, value I've read in your work, Martin, I mean, it's easy to get uh, discouraged with somebody that isn't there but that discouragement will inhibit the development because they're going to take it as a criticism. Whereas we do with people that, you know, we're not as personally involved, whatever amount of time that they can hold that space, we encourage them to do that. We either role model it with somebody else or we open the space ourselves so that they can get that feeling and come there with us. Hmm. Have you found that valuable personally, Martin? Uh, 
Well, I mean, what, what comes up for me is, so like this, this difference of, um, so like a third person understanding of, of the levels mm -hmm. and, and the first person experience of the levels. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if that totally reflects to your question, but in, in my experience, when I'm, when I'm dating, if I'm dating women who are so like pragmatic, rational, right? Like the orange stage in spiral dynamics, they they're often quite open to 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 stage development right they, they can cognitively understand you know that that people develop and, and they're they're open to that kind of hierarchical thinking mm -hmm. and uh but they have no that their first-hand experience their how they frame their experience is at the orange level so even though they can cognitively relate to the interval in higher higher stages when it comes to their uh, worldviews or how you know how how they behave in a way or or what's the right word you know how they values, yeah. operate that what their values are that they are they are still orange values and uh, and with with and that's probably you know with with uh, with green with with pluralistic it, it obviously gets a little bit more complicated or, or you know because they they often have this aversion to to any kind of hierarchy as as we know mm -hmm. um, and so I, i'm not really totally sure what your question is or where we're going with this but but you know what i'm often thriving on is is this uh the, one thing is that 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 people often self-evaluate them two stages higher than they really are. So uh, a, a rational person thinks they're integral, and and a pluralistic person thinks that they're transpersonal, right? When they read the description, uh, and I think this is all like you know in in, in the inner circles of the integral community. Uh, 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 Terry O'Fallon, is that her name? I'm yes. Drawing that blank right now. She also said once, you know, that that she knows second tier people who are in relationship with a first tier tier person, and um, and but but she couldn't give me real examples, or we didn't have a deeper conversations about conversation about that. Uh, I, I mean, I personally feel around this this whole question is is that that I can get along, you know, with, with uh, people at least at a rational or a pluralistic level, or, you know, if I date someone on that level uh, relatively well, uh, but over time, they, they usually feel sort of like a certain uneasiness uh, when there is this, like, this dissonance for them where you say, it seems like you totally understand how I see the world, mm -hmm. um, and so I get the sense that you agree with me, but there is, you know, a difference between understanding another person's perspective and agreeing or behaving at this level of their perspective. And so they then realize that there is sort of like a dissonance between, you know, they feel seen and met and understood at their level, mm -hmm. but they cannot see where I'm coming from, absolutely. Mm -hmm. you know, often in my behavior or when I talk with other people. And then when we dialogue about that, there is often then this sentence, I just don't know how to talk to you. So that, you know, yes, and, you know what I'm you. saying is like, when I can totally explain, okay, this is how I, what I sense is how you see the world. This is what, what you're saying and what you're conveying. And they go like, yes, yes, okay, you get it. Uh, and then they go like, but why are you so like acting in different ways? Or why, why, why do I feel that you're foreign to me or that there is this, this disconnect? And so it's usually a struggle for them, you know, to be with a second tier person. It's usually not so much a struggle for the second tier person to be with, with, a, with a first tier person. This is oh, interesting. Yes, so what do you think is then the interest of a second tier person to be with a first tier person? Is it uh, caring for them? Is it help it could, them? Maybe it's sex. Maybe it's sex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
know, this well, is interesting. No, it's a real question. Right. So, I mean, their interpretation of where they're going to be, I certainly agree. If they're orange, they're going to interpret it at a very orange, pragmatic level. This green is going to be plurality. But the second tier person can create a state experience uh, for both that if it's supportive and loving, although they won't be able to maintain it, they will be able to feel aspects of that state experience. And perhaps they will interpret it very orange or green. But that's, that's what, uh, I like what Beck says on this. We all have responsibility for health of the spiral. And so certainly in an intimacy, we want to have a patience and be more inspirational than judgmental. And that's easier said than done, especially yes. we're hoping from that personal level of connection. But we can see the difference when it's judgmental, they're going to get tight and they're certainly not going to feel that same experience. Um, and we don't want to start with what they're lacking uh, in order to lift them up a little bit. <laughs> That's not the right way when you say you are not blah, 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 blah. Yes. They will, uh, <laughs> Right, that doesn't work at any stage. Um, so there's a patient vision of what's possible, um, just like we do with anyone. Um, I, I find when we go to the conferences, as Martin had said, people tend to envision themselves at a higher uh, stage than they're capable of holding. And that's okay. I mean, those seeds and those are the what, what's emerging in them to some degree. And when we're with them, certainly in an intimate relationship, um, you know, we, we want to have a patience in order to float them up there uh, because of the exposure level of what it does. So, and then the, the, the final tool I tend to use is, you know, if they can see us in a relationship, sometimes when I have a couple in the room, if I have one of them that has a greater ability to create this experience, I'll do it with them so that myself and you know one of the persons in the couple, I'll do it with them so their spouse can see me do it. And it's amazing mm. the effect it has on them. Mm. You know, it, it, it's, it almost has an incestuous quality. I gotta be careful. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Isn't it? yeah. It's so intimate to take their spouse there. And of course, with guys, guys they have to be a little concerned about going homophobic with them. But <laughs> it, it really shows the power of creating that state as a growth um, medium for people. Mm -hmm. So, so I have a few comments about that. I mean, first of all, I had to smile because I do that often <laughs> in my <laughs> workshops, right? Where, uh, you know, where I kind of like, where somebody says, oh, I, I really don't feel he or she understands me or, you know, and I, I take the role of the other person and show them how, you know, how an, an interaction could be, right? And it has this, yeah, yeah. I often also feel uncomfortable, right? When, when the woman or the guy that goes like, see, you know, it's like, right. <laughs> and I go like, well, yeah, you know, I, I practice that a lot to do that. It's not, that, you know, it's, Again, it's this like embodying something versus, you know, understanding something from a third person perspective. But it's just funny. I just read up again on this last night <laughs> uh, where, where Ken is very adamant and I agree with him that, and, and, and that's one of the big fallouts he had with the spiral dynamic people and specifically with Don Beck is, is that, that Ken maintains, and I, I tend to agree with that, that you cannot have state experiences of higher levels of stages. It, you know, you, you can kind of role play that to someone and they can then see, oh, th that seems like much more mature or, or much more embracing or whatever, right? But, but I don't think it gives them a firsthand real state experience or first person real state experience of what's going on in in that case, in your mind, Tom. That, oh, so, and, and I think that's that's an important and subtle difference, right? Of of you know, so like the show and tell part, 
and then you put that and they go like oh wow i see now how this is much better and then you create a different situation and you say now you try and they're completely clueless what to do right, right. because I don't, think, uh, I don't think they can do it but whether they can experience i wasn't aware of that distinction but i've been hanging out more with the uh, dalabani and maloof uh you know people that work with uh ken i mean i don't back Mm -hmm. And uh, neighbors. <laughs> yeah, they're my neighbors are only down the street. Um, and you know, it is my impression that despite the stage development, they can still have a state experience of it. It's just that they can't hold it and they mm -hmm. can't they bring it forth. But mm -hmm. it, you're pretty clear. Ken says that they can't have that experience. Absolutely. It's an integral spirituality in the book. Uh, and he has a big, you know, sidebar or footnote in there where where he he talks about this disagreement and and you know, I mean, I have parts where I'm critical of Ken. I'm not just like his sprach uh, or mm -hmm. uh, what is the English word, you know, well, his I mouth know. <laughs> mouth pipe or something. But in this in this case, it, it is it, my, his mouthpiece. In in this case, it it it, it uh, agrees with my experience, you mm -hmm. know that. That when I role play, I, I now bought all these colored hats, right? And sometimes, you know, I, I then ch put on hats and speak from that color. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and this is really illuminating to people. And they go like, oh, my God, now I totally see, right? Where I just ch flip the hats in an argument and wear <laughs> all these different colored hats. Uh, and it's very impressive to people, but, but they but cannot then... You know, that's that's just like mo watching an interesting movie, and you see all these facets, but you cannot embody these uh, different facets. And uh, and of course, that's different from. I mean, I'm a big fan of the Wilbur Combs lattice, and 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 you know, I, I think still, and and spiral dynamics tends to do that too. Is since they only have one developmental line and don't really distinguish between spiritual state. Uh, experiences, which obviously, you know, I, I think you pointed it out in one of your papers that when you fall in love or, you know, when you interact with a person who's more present, uh, then, you know, that there is transference of that, that state, but that has nothing to do with, with your stage development that is more represented by, by spiral dynamics. And another thing I, I, I just wanted to mention about this um, um, you know, what, why do we want to interact with, with first tier people? Um, well, for me, partly it's because of just loneliness, right? Being a writer and, and living and working by myself, you know, I, I'm, I'm just often just enjoying hanging out with other people. And of course there's sexual needs and all these things, which is always a little tricky, right? To set up the right expectation to say, you know what is this relationship about and and i now have learned to do that more proactively but it has gotten me in trouble in the past a mm -hmm. few times by you know where, where where a female tends to often then equate sex and company right and having dinner and going to the movies even though if you frame it somewhat clearly that that you don't you know that i don't see a long-term relationship so it's a friends with benefits kind of thing we always think we always yeah. think he doesn't mean it and when i'm good enough then then i will get him yeah right. yeah this is an old thing this woman <laughs> but you know and you know most of of the dating relationships that i had you know women you know there was a like this deal you know you can hang out with me and 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 i'll help you or support you in developing more healthy relationship skills or, or sometimes I date women who haven't been in a relationship for a long time. And so, you know, they have to like this trust issue around men and, and sometimes they feel they can trust me after a while. Uh, and, and so, yes, it's, it's as uh, Roger Walsh said, you know, to be partly to be in, in service of, of just having sort of like a, a real life situation uh, training, which I can do because I'm not a therapist. I know you can do that, you know. So, 
that's and I, I always learn something. I mean, it's for me, it's ongoing research about how do different women, different you know, approach relationships differently. And then I say one more thing and then I shut up. Uh, what I realized recently, and, and that's certainly true in, in, in my more involved uh, uh, relationships, I'm, I realized how I feel drawn to, to, to women who are you know, a lot in the pre-trans fallacy, you know, that, that, that have so like a lot of pre-modern, pre-rational sort of like views because I like to be challenged, you know, there, and I think, you know, there, and, and I, I see how these women have a problem in finding boyfriends because they're usually so all over the map, you know, with their magical thinking, but they're also on some levels very evolved, right? And so, they're pretty much seen by everybody else as being kind of crazy, right? Because, because you know what, yeah. what I'm saying. And no, I, I found, you know, looking looking at a lot of uh, some second tier men, you know, I often find that they get engaged with with these, you know, nearly pathological women because they're the most interesting. They're they're the only ones who can really sort of ruffle their feathers and get them. You know, challenge them in their uh, in their being. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense to you, Tom? Yeah, it does. I I, I hadn't thought about uh, delineation of pre-transcendent fantasies and fallacies depending upon their emotional health. Um, you're brave to take on the ones that aren't healthy, like <laughs> say you have excessive narcissism or like borderline. Yeah, exactly. Those or hit, yeah, histrionic, you know. But but there is something fascinating about them because usually, you know, I don't want to sound too arrogant, but but normally I'm I'm not very challenged in relationships, right? It's kind of like, you know, but but these these women are fascinate me because you know they often test me like to the extreme, right? By their right uh, by 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 their you know, kind of like being all over the map. And since they often struggled in relationships their whole life, naturally, right, they learned a lot about relationships. So they have read, you know, similar books that I have read and, and they're they're constantly sort of like in search to normalize their relationships unsuccessfully. And right. then, and I, I mean, I know some other very famous integral teachers who got into these pathological relationships and I can now see, I can now see why these women, you know, were attractive to them because they're also usually very seductive. I mean, they, they normally use their sexuality to get in with a man, right? That's always their first, their first entry point and right. very quickly <laughs> become sexual. And then they're very interesting and fascinating. And then you get into this total mess of, you know, where they're just like right. all over the board on, in the stages, right? So they they really cover everything from from magic to to pluralistic, and they seem to be kind of like almost integral, right? Because they're they're functioning in in some weird way at all these levels, but then all the pathologies on all these levels and difficulties come up, and right. uh, and then and then at one point you just can't no longer take it, right? It's just like <laughs> Right. Well, most, most intimate relationships swirl in so many hormones and so much chemistry. And, you know, as we know, in a Maslonian way, that's just really the basis of connection. That, that is our, uh, Jung used to call the racial ancestral past popping up and connecting us. And uh, I think you know from reading my paper that the basic of that pre-transcendent fallacy is confusing that early hormonal driven wonderful feeling mm. with real empathic connection down the road is is where we are at this point in society mm. is trying to get away from that so we yeah. already already talked about the upper right and obviously the chemistry is an artifact of the upper right but what gives meaning to the chemistry would be the lower left uh, interpretations of it and we know in the lower left the unrealistic levels of romanticizing and that that level of love can be sustained without empathic awareness 
is where we're struggling right now. And that's what's mm -hmm. leading relationships at this point. Yeah, I, that was really, I had never thought about it that way. And when I read your paper, I thought it was a really clear and important i mean intuitively we all know this right but but i think you made a really good point uh, uh that that's a great example of the pre-trans fallacy thank you so thank you for that yeah i yeah. want to talk something out of the feminine perspective or female perspective uh, i went into pre-trans fallacy too in my life and i had a borderline uh, husband and the thing is how to get rid of them before you are dead, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is really, uh, it might be different from a, a man to, towards a woman because men are considered that they are quite easily changing, you know. While women are much more attached often to, to their relationships. And so this caring aspect which we have, and but I was caught into when I got it that he was not. Now I have to do something to help him, you know, and this is a real big trap. But I can confirm that it was sort of exciting, but because he was different. And I don't like normal people who are boo, 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 every day the same. So it was, ex yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was exciting for a while until it got so crazy you know, that uh, it was unsustainable. And so I'm wondering if this is a difference uh, between women. men and women. What, because, yeah, we have also the sexual attraction, but many people say women are more looking like to status. And just an, just an idea. Right. Uh, Warren Farrell, really articulates this well when you know he talks about a woman is when they connect are looking for everything to change the relationship evolves into their primary fantasy or a man's primary fantasy being you know having sex as much as possible we kind of push that aside in order to join a woman in hers and you know we have to admit their fantasy is a little bit more comprehensive than sustainable for society than ours but, but it is a loss for men and until we have masculinism and we get realistic about what women are and aren't this isn't going to come together we're still going to have the tension i mean most men don't talk about it that is what i love about martin's work is he's articulated it from the man's perspective and it really hasn't reached the zenith yet it needs to we need masculinism yeah. So, because I'm not a therapist and not trained, you know, I, in my book I have, in, in integral relationships, I have this line, you know, we leave pathologies, you know, I'm, I'm no longer, or, or I stop talking about pathologies here and we leave that to the experts and there are a lot of books out there that address that, but I found in, in my new book I'm actually adding that in because you know, a lot of the relationship books, they deal with shadow elements, but I haven't really seen any relationship books that, that talk about the experiences of being with, with, with you know, borderline histrionic uh, uh, split personality, narcissism, and, and things like, I mean, real pathologies. And uh, my experience around that was, uh, you know, being with a borderline, in a border, with a borderline woman is uh, like this, this deep shame because, you know, the, the, the pattern is obviously that, that she throws yourself herself at you and you're the greatest in the world. And then once, once you're hooked, right, mm -hmm. then, and you probably know that Heidi, then, you know, so they look very supportive in the beginning, but as soon as they have you hooked, you pretty quickly become the support person for them. And it becomes this total one way street. And, and they blame their unhappiness, right? That has been there all along, totally on you. And then we know about the fear shame dynamic, right? That the primary emotional reaction for males when there is 
relationship challenges is shame and that's why we usually then withdraw and go into our cave while uh, it is fear in women of, of abandonment and that that of course then creates this this fear shame dynamic that that is described in how to fix your marriage without talking about it by, by <laughs> Sosti at love which is one of the best I think it's a great book um, and so you know I I fell into this thing where, where you know, she had a problem, was crying, was unhappy, you know, and then came to me for support. And then two, three hours later, you know, we had sort of like resolved the problem by, by me more or less being the therapist, the support person for her. And for a while that made me feel, feel really good because then, oh, I was able to help her and now she's happier and the sex is great and afterwards, right? And you feel this deep intimacy or I felt this deep intimacy with her. But uh, I talked with Mark, uh, what's his last name? Uh, integral therapy guy. Uh, Foreman. Mark Foreman about it, you know, and because he had pointed it out that, that, that uh, a partner cannot be the therapist, you know, or, you know, for, for the other partner. And he said, well, that's, that's not completely not how he meant it. He just meant if it becomes a one-way street where there's a, like emotional support from one person to the other, but no emotional support, you know, in, in, in the verse. In other words, when I had a problem or a need or something I wanted to talk about, it's like, oh, well, you know, you, I have it much worse and, and you have to be here for me, <laughs> right? And oh. I don't want to talk. I don't see your problem. I don't want to, I cannot support you, right? You, you oh, cannot I was me married to her too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But then, you know, I, I just felt like I should be more enlightened. I shouldn't have any problems. I should be able to be there for her. And, and she, you know, had this talent of shaming me of, oh, you're not, the one you pretended to be, right? And 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 now you no longer want to help me, and 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 I think I have to leave you, right? And 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 this this emotional blackmail started until you're completely uh, uh, exhausted, right? And and you just can no longer give. On the other side, you know, as we know with with borderline people, they're also in public, you know, very charismatic. And, and very likable, like Princess Diana or, or Marilyn Monroe or these people. So, so what, what really did me in, right, is when she then talked to other people about what a horrible person I am, right, that, you know, and, and, or when she was crying or something like that, that people looked at me and said, what are you doing to this woman, right? And, 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 and what's wrong with, they felt there is something wrong with me, right? By, so can I come in because we have integral couples from an uh, intimate couples from an integral perspective, and you are in your book uh, giving guidelines how to choose a person. So, what would you say to to, to you uh, advise people to avoid these challenges? Or, I mean, there's definitely a big interval between stages of development, no? A borderline person and a, let's say, aspiring second tier person. So you say that's better, no? To, to be nearer, to have a, be nearer in, in, the, the, in the development uh -huh. stage. At least I understand it like this. So what would you say? You, do you do that for experiment and knowing more or would you do it also as a private person let's say <laughs> wanting to find the partner for your life so, who are you who, asking? Who, yeah who you're asking i think yeah. there's a question for tom here so <laughs> no no this is oh. uh, I'm Is asking it? at the moment you, yeah. Martin, because yeah. I know yeah. that you uh, are not married, at least not at the moment. And yeah. Tom seems to be married as far as I know. So I ask you, do you, uh, you have sort of the freedom to go out and uh, well, try sure. out different people? Yeah. So, um, Well... First of all, you know, I, and, and this is all like a warning, right? In, in my book, in my first book, this is not covered. And so I, I went into this trap, right? And, and made, a, a, made an emotional and financial investment in, you know, in, in, in two 
you know, one woman was histrionic, I think the other one was borderline. And then not, then I realized, oh, you know, I, I tend to be attracted or, or these women tend to be attracted to me in the first place. You know, they, they come to me because I'm different. And I fell sort of like for, you know, for them, because as, as we all now establish, you know, they're just much more interesting than, than so like the normal healthy woman. And that's a, like a warning. I think a lot of integral men, you know, unknowingly, you know, make real commitments or investments in, into these, in these types of women. How I handle it now is that I usually, you know, I, I spot it relatively quickly and, 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 and I have healthy boundaries. So that was obviously my problem of not having healthy boundaries, being mm-hmm. naive. And I say, well, we can be friends and this is what we can share, right? And what I'm available for, but I'm not available for, I just give a simple example. You know, one of the women, you know, she said, I want to go out with you and I want you to buy me some things. And, and I said, you know, that, that we could both enjoy. And, and I was open to that, but I said, you know, I'm only willing to spend this amount of money. Right. And, and unless you agree to that, I'm not willing to go. And, sure, and she agreed. And sure enough, when we were there, she went like, oh, buy me this and buy me this. And, and you know, I had really put down and then she got the salesperson involved and said, oh, look at, you know, he doesn't want to buy me that. Right. And, and I mean, there was this total. I mean, it was crazy, you know, but I put down my food and said, we had an agreement. You know, this is the budget. And if that's not OK with you, then I'm leaving right now. Right. So. That's just an example of how I now can still interact with people like that because I learned to have healthy boundaries. And I'm sure, Tom, you have something to say that ultimately it's a boundary issue if you allow yourself to get tracked into this, in, into relationships like that. It says more about you, I mean, in this case about me, about my lack of healthy boundaries than it says about anything ro- being wrong with the other person. Right. Yes, it, and uh, picking up on your last point, what it, who we pick really is a mirror of our own developmental stage or some complementary function. I mean, in a chaotic way, every relationship makes sense in some way, I find. But more on a personal note, since you've disclosed so much also, my solution to it was to find another psychologist to marry, who at least had a good education background. <laughs> yeah. And then it was funny, in, in my fifth year of grad school, I was doing my dissertation in marital satisfaction. And I'll never forget, I was in personal growth therapy at the same time. And my therapist says to me, Tom, you think you're a little afraid of marriage? And it hit me like a brick. <laughs> that, oh yeah, that's why I'm so interested in all this. I'm trying to intellectually prepare for what I'm deadly afraid of. (laughs) And I mean, it never occurred to me that I I was compensating for, you know, some fear I had around uh, marriage. Mm. Getting a little closer to what Heidi had said, now how do we do this is once we get by that early stage when the chemistry's flowing and we think we died and went to heaven, we're really swallowing hook, line, and sinker, a pre-transcendent fallacy at that moment. And if we can keep, you know, recognizing the experience, it's, it's really pretty basic. Can they problem solve without melting down? Are they satisfied with something when they get it? Or does it just open up a wound larger and it's really a dark pit they're going into? Do they have a vision themselves of what a relationship is? You know, have they done enough interior work so that when they show up, they don't decompensate? Like I I found people, you know, you open up a space for them and because they're so hungry for contact, they just fall apart in a sea of depression and emptiness. And it's a very painful experience for them. And until they really kind of work through some of what's held, you know, a shadow or an unconsciousness, it's going to be painful for them for a while. And I kind of remind them that, you know, joy will be down the road when you feel that connection. But right now, you can't do that yet. So 
it, it's really getting a feel of how do they handle things, not so much what they say, but how do they mm. actually show up in any moment? Yeah. It's just interesting to me how the, the geographical, like in Northern California, where I lived most of the last 20 years, you know, people there, men and women, seem to be much more open to doing this healing and growth work. I'm now almost three years in LA. There's hardly anybody here who's interested in that. They all just want to have the, you know, if, if, if work is involved in a relationship, you know, it's like they're not interested. It's kind of like yeah, you know, I'm I'm just about 80 miles south of you, Martin, and in Orange County, they have drank the American dream in you know huge quantities, and they mm. define themselves on material wealth and how they yeah. look, you know, yeah. physically. And it's really kind of sad because it's not fulfilling a deeper need, and then when they look for a spiritual interpretation. I'm always amused that the Catholics are the progressives in Orange County, uh, mm. because the you know more fundamental Christians tend to be even more mythic oriented. Mm. Yeah, yeah, the Catholics are the progressives. Yeah, in, in Orange County, who would have thunk yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, <Fine. laughs> I don't know if I can put in a quick um, a pitch, or I don't know if it's a pitch, but um, you know. Uh, where I am now is, and that's why I'm writing this new book is, you know, I, I feel I, you know, or, or we, you know, as, as a, like a, a community, we have somewhat exhausted, you know, the tools uh, by having self other relationships, you know, at, at looking at each other. And I'm not saying we have used them all, but there is so much stuff out there, right. Uh, that's available to, 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 to co-create healthy relationships. But what I felt was the motivator really to, to use these tools uh, is often not there because the relationships don't have a, a higher meaning that just that, that theoretical, at least, you know, learning, healing, growing, awakening, right? To, to what is it, to clean up, to grow up, to show up and to, to wake up kind of thing, right? And you know what I mean? We're looking at each other. And so I, over time from, you know, um, I got on, on this trip of shared, what I call transcendental purpose. I, I, mm -hmm. I don't want to call it higher purpose or authentic or unique or evolutionary purpose. I just call it transcendental. And, and so that's what I'm really now excited about is, is to, to sharing you know, to, to create more good truth, beauty, or function in the world, which relates back to the, to the four quadrants. And the, the interesting thing is that, that I found out that it's actually genetically encoded in us that we have, you know, pre different levels of pre-conditioned uh, genetic predispositions of having capacities for, for empathy, which is goodness, for cognitive intelligence, which, which is truth, for creativity, which is creating beauty in the widest sense, and for kinesthetic abilities, right, which is more creating function. And so, so what, what drives me now as an attractor in, in relationships, besides, you know, all the chemistry and the sexual and, and all these things that are so widely explored, this is how couples can really complement each other because you have the greatest impact in the world if you have a balance between, you know, if you want to create something or, or be a change agent, you know, if you have capacity for empathy, for cognitive intelligence, for aesthetics, for beauty, and for function, but no, nobody has so like talents in all of these four areas, right? And so let's say like you, uh, Mark and Heidi, that's why I'm so excited about to know you and to be a guest on your show, right? You, you have this this purpose of what, what you represent with the wisdom factory. And I'm sure you experience that all the time, how you complement each other and you couldn't do by yourself what you can do together. Right. That's right. Absolutely. And this is for me now a much bigger attractor and a reason to, to, you know, for would be a reason for me to, to really make a commitment to a, to a person for me would now only be based if we would share, 
you know, if she would share my my passion and purpose for, you know, uh, uh, promoting integral relationships or integral love relationships, I right? Would. And and then and then in service of 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 you know of serving this this purpose in the world, you know, I would probably go to huge lengths to do any healing, learning, growth, and awakening that 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 may still be. Uh, necessary, right, to, to best fulfill this higher purpose. Mm. I probably wouldn't go to great lengths just to please her, right? Mm. Or so, like, you know, I'm, I'm over 60 years old now, right? Mm. I would have to have a different reason to change, you know, and say, okay, that makes me a better man and a better partner to serve this, this transcendental purpose that we share. Mm. And I think this gives relationships a whole new. Uh, uh, quality, right? So we both have to say something. Yeah. To that. yeah. I just <laughs> want to say I'm still not clear, or, or I'm, 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 since I haven't fully, I only tested that with two women who were first tier, and that had certain pathologies, right? Coming back to that, so that made it even harder because yeah. in the end, when these relationships didn't work out, I was so bummed out about the missed opportunity that we had together to make a difference in the world that I felt I could make do more effectively with each of them. And that's over the last seven years or six years. So it's mm -hmm. right. Uh, so that made it even harder to let go of these relationships because of that missed opportunity. It was not so hard, you know, just around the sexual and psychological and, and company part. Well, I just <clears throat> wanted to say the, the last five minutes here, I, I've sort of gotten rejuvenated and reinterested in in the in the conversation we're having because what you're talking about, Martin, is just what electrifies me too, and this mm. is what charges me to go on and on. And of course, we have the everyday difficulties that we have to work through, and I yell at her, and it hurts her, and I I'm always sorry about that. Uh, but we, we can patch those things up and move on. And mm -hmm. uh, we were creating something together that uh, we would not have done alone. It's mm -hmm. only because you are jealous because sometimes I know it better. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes you do. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to, to add, you said the same passion. I don't think you need the same passion. But it must be compatible and maybe even complementary. You mm. know, uh, uh, when you make it so, 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 how do you say, so strict, so narrow, the, the choice that you, uh, let's say, for instance, both people have to love skiing, you know, Ski. uh, skiing, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and run down the. This is, yeah, but they don't necessarily. No, need but that's, to. that's, that's, I call an interest. So, ah, okay. So I tell you why, you know, the, so of course that's now, so like, that's, that's a, like the highest level I feel where people say, I want to have a partner who supports me in my purpose and then I'll support him or her in his or her purpose. Right. But then there can always be another person who can do that better. Right. Or if you feel like, oh, I'm no longer getting the support in, in my purpose. Right. Then you know, the, the, the relationship has the potential to break up. If you both have the same purpose, I would transcendental say purpose, then, then you really feel that, that you, so like, you know, the, you know the, your partner provides the second wing so you can fly. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and transcendental purpose is not skiing or, or an okay. interest or a mm -hmm. hobby. It is based in, in creating more good, true, beauty and okay. function in the world and is focused in, you know, in, in, in furthering sort of like a, a cause in okay. that way. So that's why I think, and so some people, they go like, oh God, no, that sounds like way too enmeshed and, and too, you know, involved. And other people, they just go like, holy crap, you know, because it gets them out of this circular, you know, a lot of women say, oh, yeah, then I was with this guy and he helped me for two years to reach that level and then he had nothing to offer me. I mean, I, I mainly listen to women. I'm sure that's uh, true for men too. And then I met the next person and he helped me with this or she helped me with that. And right, and so we're, we're seeming to climb this ladder 
and being in this serial monogamy thing because there isn't something that really binds people so like you know on a deeper level which used to be children right and and family so you know in, in the past like until 50 100 years ago what bound us together was our our children and our family and then we died right <laughs> so that, around 50 or so but 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 a lot of people now you know it's 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 easier to raise children in a way right in in a modern and postmodern world and, and 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 obviously we know there is a lot of single parents out there so that that has gone away as as really a, a connecting element and I just tell people, look at you know Bill and Melinda Gates. Could you imagine Bill Gates, you know, doing what he does in the world without her? Or look at Michelle and Barack Obama. Or it, you know, there are these power couples like you are, right, mm -hmm. where you clearly feel they can only manifest, you know, in the world what they do as a couple, and you could like almost not imagine that they would have the same impact individually mm -hmm. yeah. and i think i really think that this is very likely so like the future of relationships is that people you know get in touch with their what a lot of people call higher or authentic purpose and there's all these purpose guides out there which i think is great but few of them take it to the next level and say you know now when you know your whatever word they use your purpose right now learn how to share that with a partner and and that's what i developed in the quadrants and the, the chakras and you know how you co-create at the level of all chakras and stuff like that and that's really what what i find exciting now you know moving away from this like finding the most difficult person who's also <laughs> kind of like the most attractive and then throw yourself into that cesspool, right? And then just try to come out of it a little bit more, you know, clean than so you know, where you went in, right? So, so yeah. this no longer fascinates me. Yeah. What what fascinates me now is is a, is, is a shared purpose. Yeah. Wait, Can yeah. I bounce off of that? Yes, yes absolutely. absolutely. So um, I, I think we're all familiar with Patricia Albert's work on evolutionary collective consciousness, mm -hmm. yeah. and. Uh, Barbara Max Hubbard's work on non-local consciousness. But obviously there's a progression here is that we have to grow individually and in already to participate with these higher purposes, these, you know, these transcendental uh, type of connections to the emergent. And as we said earlier, I think intimate couples will do it to a degree but because it's so risky, it may be the final resting pace, place of these capabilities, a really lovely resting place, but it just seems safer to do it with people that the complexity isn't there that's there with intimacy. Um, I know I can connect deeper with certain people other than my wife. And I suspect that is, that's a symmetry that's going to be true for a lot of people. So yeah, I mean, that's where we're headed ultimately is that level of resonance and co-emergence. But I do believe that it's going to be done with other people. And I, I love Albert's work, I love Hubbard's work. That's what I'm doing at San Diego Integral is putting people together and see, I don't wanna just be collective eyes. I wanna be collective we's in a unitive space. But we're going to learn how to do that with strangers, I think. I don't agree. I... Yeah, I, I also disagree. <laughs> and I know Patricia very well. I taught a course with her. And we're good friends. And, um, and I talked with Barbara Marx Hubbard about that as well. Um, and, and I think, you know, there, there, there is again this, this, this lack of really aligning you know your your into your intentions in a way, you know, with truly your actions in all the four quadrants very often. Mm. So, so, yeah. I would it's like to easier ask. said than done. Hmm? Pardon? Yeah. It, it's easier said than done. I mean, to really get it all aligned mm. and be able to handle an intimacy is a formidable task. So obviously, mm. there will be some couples that can achieve it. But I do think we're going to achieve it outside of intimacy first. Mm. 
you know, just as a general tendency. Yeah, not yeah. An absolute no, I agree with you. I understand, understand that. that. I would mm -hmm. like to say that I think, as in our case, we choose each other because of that, because we wanted to go together. So mm -hmm. uh, I know that I can be very short time intimate with people in a group, but I have no problem to be very intimate with him. So uh, even more intimate, I would say. Mm -hmm. yes. So um, I can I can understand what you say, Tom. But I think really that the couple is the place where the real development takes place. The real, because that's the challenge, as you say it. That's the practice. That's the practice. Yeah. And yeah. I think when we are good in having intimate relationships, and that's my hope, you know, then we create peace on earth. Because yeah. I think this is the problem. When we don't, are not able to do it with our uh, partners, how can we really think to do it with enemies to be yeah. get into contact you know and create peace so that's my idea we are very much over the hour yeah. so at this yeah. point <laughs> I may i just throw in throw in some some little thing there you know which is also outlined in detail in in my new book is that you know i think this is why a lot of these groups like like andrew cohen's and other groups are are, are failing because they're caught between this what's called social atomism right where, where you see a lot of individuals and then they create so like a community right? and so you have individuals and community and that's a, a typical sociological problem and, and dr fellman and many other, and some other people point out that it's better to create uh, a holarchy where where you have individuals who form couples and then these couples form communities right so we're skipping in a way uh you know the couple level and so you see in these communities that they fall apart relatively quickly because there isn't the clue of the couple that that binds the individual to the community and you basically are directly then exposed or dependent on the community mm -hmm. right for for your social environment. And that actually makes you more unfree in a way, even though people think they're free as individuals, they don't realize that they're much more dependent on the community or society as individuals than they are as couples, mm -hmm. right? The couple provides in a way a buffer or a link between the social construct or the community and the individual. It's it's a little bit of a mind bender, but, but, yeah. but the, Again, there, there's it. a lot to be said about that. Yeah, and, and, and I'm kind of sad that it took us this long to disagree about something. <laughs> 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 because, you know, we've, we've kind of run out of time. Uh, yeah, and uh, I want to give some more space to Tom yeah. to say his final elaboration <laughs> of this talk. Well, I enjoyed it. This talk could go on for hours, as we sense. And, you know, we, as Wilbur likes to say, we hold these speculations loosely because we really don't know to some degree how yeah. it's going to emerge. We're, we're all speculating about what form it'll take and ultimately where it'll it end up. But I'm, I'm confident it's going to emerge. It will emerge. It is emerging. And by doing what we are doing, we are helping to emerge it, every one of us. So it's really, this is what I imagine the future, that we are really collaborating in some way, you know, and doing everybody doing what they do, but then come together and, and how do you say, connect the pieces <laughs> to something greater. Okay. So in this sense, well, I would say thank you very much. And if well, you still I want to thank Tom, for, for, yeah, yeah, okay. thank you, Tom thank for your you. contributions and for your for your work, you know, being like on the ground level. That's really great. And I guess we will have to have a new talk because I know Tom wanted to show some uh, graphics and he didn't. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to do, make a new appointment for yeah. another time. Okay. Okay. And I, to all the audience, there are people in the audience who haven't shown up in the comment stream. I thank you very much to have been here mm -hmm. and stay tuned. We will go on with all these conversations and you will see that we are normal people 
talking about normal <laughs> things. <laughs> it might be helpful. And if you have understanding problems, please reach out and ask every one of us. Yes, just yes, ask questions. Yes, Absolutely. ask questions. And read the books and the papers. Oh, yes. So that would be the last thing. Where can the people uh, reach you? Can you give your email or, or your website uh, addresses? Mm -hmm. Just spell it or... And they'll be in the timestamps. Um, mm -hmm. My website is mpccares.com. And papers that we talked about today can be reached on uh, academia.edu. Uh, I just put my name in Tom Habib. Okay, and we will also put them in the event page when you send me the links. Okay. Sure. And my website is integral relationship. Dot com. Okay. And so we meet again. Yes. Thank you, everybody. So Thank you. Have a great bye -bye. day.